Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Normally, I feature one poet per show, but in honor of National Poetry Month, I'm spotlighting six gifted writers this time. Each of these poets has given a wonderful interview here during the past year. Today, their poems will do most of the talking. Our first three writers are Afa Michael Weaver, Martha Collins, and Jenny Barber. As you listen to their words again, you may notice pauses and nuances you missed the first time. Let yourself feel the power in their words because their words have left an indelible mark on readers and the literary world. We'll begin with Afa, a powerful example of the profound changes that can come when poetry enters someone's life. Writing helped him deal with years of trauma and have brought him from factory work in Baltimore to teaching at Simmons College. His latest book, The Government of Nature, recently won the prestigious Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. Next, we'll hear from Martha Collins, who challenges racism and apathy in her poems. She refuses to let fear or convention trap her or the poets whose work she has translated into English. Jenny Barber rounds out the first segment. As editor of Salamander Magazine, she has helped many find a voice. Her own writing gives voice to sacred texts and the search for connection. The poem is, uh, the epigraph is, To My Uncle the Cowboy. The blood bay mare, deep red black with yellow, her mane and waves after we braided it, white blaze frosting her nose, and I took too long to comb her, patting her up under her belly the way a 14-year-old boy would do. And you snatched the brush away before I could get to cool her down with water, snatched her from my hands to your hands, from the soft wonder to a rough smack of a backhand as a threat, a backhand that beat a stallion until the white of its eyes came untied from the bone back of an eyeball soft gel. And fear hit me the way tears light up like flames afraid to let themselves go when a child is made to know what animals must know, the beating down, blood and meat where spirit and song should be. You bred this mare named after dreaming of names, bred her to the neighbor's proud Appaloosa stallion, some blood bay on his front, a big blanket behind, white spread over his rump of dark dots like eyes, bred her and brought her back to say the foal was mine. Mine for odd reasons you would not name. We walking into the farmhouse, through the back door to the kitchen, telling me you were going to leave me a million dollars, a million dollars of insurance when you were gone to the coffin, when all I can do is stroke the thin fibers of your good hair and the stone leather the skin comes to be. Hardness, the hollow wood of death, or the way things are beaten down, down, until the hands of hurt force a child to nurse on terror. Remember for my granddaughter. If I forget to plug the sun, let me know. If I forget to tame the shark's teeth, let me know. If I forget to stop the tsunamis, let me know. If I forget to tie up the bears, let me know. If I forget to chase away the viruses, let me know. If I forget to clean the unclean foods, let me know. If I forget to stop rushing cars, let me know. If I forget to tame the lightning, let me know. If I forget to melt the slippery ice, let me know. If I forget to outlaw nightmares, let me know. If I forget to put perverts away, let me know. If I forget that the divine thing moved inside me to write this, the thing that can do all things, let me know. Let me down easy into the earth. Be 
because my father said yes, but not in our lifetimes. Because my mother said, I know my daughter would never want to marry. But mostly because they rarely spoke of or noticed or even whispered about and did not, of course. Because magazines rarely, TV rarely, textbooks rarely or not at all, except for figures like George Washington Carver, who'd lived in our state. Because among the crayons, there was one called flesh. Because paintings rarely or never until. Because books from the library never until. Because college literature not at all. The American Lit Anthology had only Gwendolyn Brooks, who was not assigned. Because a few years after Brown v. Board of Education, I wrote a paper that took the position, yes, but not yet. The skin under all skin is all white. Mm -hmm. Seen skin is skin deep. None mm -hmm. is white. Pink is blood showing through almost transparent thin skin, blood as in on our hands, protected by gloves, laws, guns, while brown, tan to almost black, protects from sun that burns us, red-handed us. Although my father, although my mother, although we rarely, although we whispered, although the silence, although the absence, although even now some TV, books, not to mention radio, websites, new militias, hate groups raging against our socialist, communist, fascist, although, but still. Our textbooks now, our museums mostly, our college literature courses, even our crayons, not to mention our young president, who could scarcely have been imagined when we, when I. And although I've gone back and filled in some blanks, I'm still learning this unlearning, untying the knot of yes, but rewriting this yes yes mm. I thought I'd read a poem from my first book rigging the wind um, and the book has a lot of poems uh, that are set in Spain where I lived for a time and the poem I'll read uh, is about uh, the village that I lived in and in the village there were mostly older people there and many of them had in living memory the um, the Spanish Civil War, mm. um, which um, they often were reluctant to talk about. This is called Night. No one here dreams louder than the wind, knocking at the doors where Franco's men conscripted farmers' sons 50 years ago. It blows over strips of farms no wider than a pony run in rivers made of diphthongs like the Eo through the greedy heads of eucalyptus trees, the bearded maimed pines and villages whose steeples are crowned with absurdly large stork nests set awry. After a card game, in the bar, the men scrape back their chairs. They leave in twos and threes. Children and grandchildren have moved to cities farther south. The men are all that's left, a knock at the door and the wind's long memory of a bloody mountain pass thigh deep in mud. Mm -hmm. I kind of um, went in that direction um, when considering the Song of Songs. 
So here's the poem. The lovers in their urgency met on the hill. It was nighttime, it was dawn. Sun shone on the garden wall, on the startled new branches of the apple trees. It was noon, it was afternoon, for the gossips at the gate, the almond tree, the fig, the spring light on the grass, the betraying bird calls. No one knew what to say to the lovers in their need. Mm. So this poem is called God Doesn't Speak in the Psalms. And that's what I like. A flock of psalms, a deck, a pack, shuffling praise and fear and need. Last night in my dream, a donkey's tongue ripped out by the children of the town. The donkey stood in a small field. I didn't know if he could eat. I left an apple by his hoof. No inkling of an afterlife, no scale pans for weighing souls to see which ones are light and heavy, like metals, like elemental salts. Across the street, a storm door slams. Finches in the juniper fly up. I'm leafing through the Psalms. A man laments the illness wasting him and compares himself to a lone bird on a roof with no prayer, eating ashes of bread. How then does he turn in praise of the sky like a tent over the earth? and ancient cities, stones, and dust. August, afternoon. Somebody gathers figs. Somebody walks with a seed bag slung over his shoulder, weeping as he sows. An ear, a voice, coming apart between my hands. God doesn't speak in the Psalms. God's spoken to. The next segment features three poets whose work is touching, memorable, and full of hope. Gary J. Whitehead, Harris Gardner, and Mimi White know how to take an ordinary moment or a simple detail and transform it into something extraordinary. But these three aren't just accomplished poets. They have invested in the lives of countless writers and are generous, gracious guides. I was thrilled to have Gary on the set because I've admired his work for many years and his poems never disappoint. Harris is a genius at creating poetry venues and he has given many people, including me, the opportunity to read our work in public. Mimi was my first mentor in college and her exquisite lines still inspire me to work harder and push myself as a writer. You'll enjoy the next few clips, many of which were taped after our interviews ended. I thought I would start with the title poem, A Glossary of Chickens. There should be a word for the way they look with just one eye, neck bent, for beetle or worm or strewn grain, gleaning, maybe, between gizzard and grit. And for the way they run towards someone they trust, their skirts hiked, their plump bodies wobbling, bobbling, let's call it, inserted after blowout and before brood. There should be terms, too, for things they do not do, like urinate or chew, but perhaps there already are. I'd want a word for the way they drink, head thrown back, throat wriggling like an old woman swallowing a pill, a word beginning with S coming after sex feather and before mm. shank, and one for the sweetness of hens but not roosters. We think that by naming we can understand as if the tongue were more than muscle. They called me the wimp 
and I was. Not for any reason I can put my finger on, but because, in general, I lacked wherewithal. I was a poltroon, and none of them knew that word or any better than wimp, and probably they still don't. If one of them does, I wouldn't know so. Those years before and during and after high school swirl in my memory now like squalls of snow, like the time when, on a whim, in late December, my friends and I told our folks we were going camping in the wildlife refuge two towns over, the flakes already falling, our gear pitiful hand-me-downs, none of it insulated or waterproof, rum bottles clinking in our knapsacks like muffled toasts to the end of our young lives. Inches had fallen by the time we bivouacked at the Caratunk Cave. Wet kindling whispered, not even leaves would catch. In five o'clock dark, we crawled into the tent, soaked and shivering and stoned, no one willing to state the obvious that we might die out there in what we all knew by then was a blizzard unpredicted. Who it was had the wherewithal to suggest we pack it in, I don't recall, but I remember humping, drunk and exhausted, through two-foot drifts in the hushed woods, my toes gone numb in thin boots, our flashlight beams a mix-up mystification panning over moguls of snow-covered brush. I wouldn't have minded expiring there under the laden arms of a spruce. The past is a distance, and life has at times been a stumbling through thick drifts, batteries dying. They'd think of me still as the wimp. So there's the future, like the lost pair of sneakers we found in the spring, and growing between their double knotted laces, a sapling. So this is owl pellet I show my students. This gray loaf full of tiny bones, a gift I found on a park road, like something a car drove over, once mouse or mole, but now a skeleton sewed into one undigestible measure. No more than half an ounce, this used to be whiskered skitterer who once engaged in nocturnal pleasure. Not so unlike you, reckless, reckless youth. Scapula, fibula, tibia. What is it that surrounds all these bones? In truth, I cannot say. Just as I cannot say what will one day, under its caped wings, gulp you down whole, my soft little <laughs> mousies, my tender moles. This is called When Answers Chase Their Tails. And the little epigraph that this starts with is, if you can keep your head when those about you are losing theirs, and that's from Roger Kipling's poem, If. So, when answers chase their tails, say that the ocean's murmuring of voice reveals mysteries. Say that the mountains leap, or do they tremble when plates rattle on the shelf? Say that the trees bow in reverence before the words of primal wind. Say that death visits you in dreams. Say that you refuse to take the first step on the journey that never ends except you do when you first kick and scream your entrance into life. Say that you won't dance on graves of the wicked, although the temptation is strong. Say that the world wobbles because humanity is out of bounds. Say that your design is righteous, but you can't cure every wrong. Say that the first step to heal the planet is to plant a tree or seed. One benign act begets another. Say that you need to nurture your neighbor even if half the world globe disagrees. Say that mortal conflict creates new rivers when the waters recede back to the banks. New gravestones raise their dripping heads to inquire about the dead. Say that life has many doors and knocks. You're blameless half the time with a little luck. Don't get stuck in the muck with others' rebuke. Say that you have options, except when you don't. Rose with roses, paths with thorns, sometimes both. Say that they should select the door that hides the lady. Avoid the tiger that grumbles on an empty stomach and dreams of a full belly. 
you want the door on the right. And this is called uh, Almost a Poet. Do you remember this one? Or did I ever say it for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Once upon a clock in a wild, wound down time, an hour starved to shadow. Nibbled and nicked by razor seconds that flowed through a slit in its fabric. A bullet built a nest in a young soldier's brain, a youth so certain of forever. Only the old volunteer led foot breaks that called halt to breath. Death's surprise etched his eyes, strange to find a wildflower field to nevermore. In his mud cake pockets, the medics found half finished poems. Verses penned in a dim light's halo. No closure, no end, unless a home flared a window of a soul with compass wings to dress new stanzas in bone and flesh. That was an old chestnut. Okay, this is a phony poem. Um, it's a pun. Um, out of town, out of state, out of my mind, unfettered in space, whilst a tight squeeze, a cool breeze blows past as I bounce among stars. Tramplings and boomerangs, wherewith thoughts stampede, words in need seek a pen. This is a record of a recording, of a recording of my voice. Please feel free to leave a message or not. I haven't got a wisp of a clue when I'll get back to you. Love Looks Out begins with a line by Jane Hirschfield. There are openings in our lives of which we know nothing. A house on the harbor with every window dark, one where a lamp is sun and moon, the sea rushing the breakwater, pebbles sloughing the thinnest rime of salt, till what is held in the mind is circular, surrendering, ambered, a bee's wing suspended in yellow light. If a car had not been parked in the crushed shell drive, if the rail of the bed had not caught my eye, there are openings in our hearts of which we know nothing. A tune played all day in my head until the first words came. Requiem. If I had all the time in the world, I would lie on this hammock and listen to birds. Every day I would record their songs, sketch their shapes against the creamy fog, and pay no attention to the cough, the bomb, the black and white silhouette of homes with or without sun. The bird flies through memory in and out of broken windows. Now and then it balances on a shattered sill, catching its beak and eye, its mortal reflection. And then the singing, oh, the singing. When lavender in bloom will do. Dogs ought not, but they do, die living with abandon. Faithful as monks who fill the abbey with light that seeks stone chinks and is gone as if nothing had been song. Dogs gone too, so lavender in bloom must do. This is for David Carroll, who is a New Hampshire naturalist and watercolorist and former uh, McCarthy, MacArthur Genius Award. What the Wind Says. There is no sadness when wind topples a pine and leaves a hole to light, for light to find and darkness too. Just the letting go of boughs across the century, then the long green return. The mind inhabits slowly, methodically, birdsong, shelter. But imagine an emptiness so vast, no forest field or rabbit hole, no warren den or hollow log, no voice in the wilderness. Who then will scribe for the wind when the wind has nothing to say 
and no place to go. The return. If I ask for nothing, an unexpected awakening finds me. My father listening to carousel early Sunday morning. Even now, it creates a family out of thin air. Odysseus found his father in the garden dressed as a beggar. The disguise he questioned, but never the watering, never the garden. On my father's peach tree, 12 ripening fruit glisten. Several others fell to drought, to being too small to thrive. Still, what lasts is more than enough. I hope you've enjoyed this special edition of Poetic Lines. Come back next month for another engaging interview. Yes, we're HCAM TV, but movies also? Dive In Drive In is a new program featuring the HCAM staff's favorite B movies. Check our schedule at HCAM.TV for the next showing of some of the more forgotten films, black and white or color. Join Mike Terosian and myself as we introduce and give you some interesting facts about the cast and crews of classic movies. We hope you'll enjoy these treasured films of yesteryear. All of these babies are part of the same family, the Text for Baby family. Text for Baby is a free service for moms during pregnancy and until their baby's first birthday. Each week, moms get free text messages on nutrition, labor, delivery, breastfeeding, immunization, things moms need to know today. And your phone company won't charge you for the text messages. Sign up now. Just text the word BABY to 511411.